All right, everybody, I understand the, we've reached a quorum, so we have enough people here now, or a large number of people now. I can see the number of participants going up by the moment. It's like one of those lottery things where the jackpot keeps increasing, 78. So I hope we'll get a few more than that. In any case, welcome to this, uh, this uh, talk at BAA this month. Tonight's talk introduces us to the work of the Tracing the Past project hosted by the University of Liverpool funded by the Arts and Humanities Research Council and, and directed by uh, Alex Buchanan, uh, whom a lot of us know, of course. I'm not going to say very much about the project work itself by way of introduction, because you're going to hear about that from the experts in a minute. Uh, but uh, I, do, I do want to introduce our, our troika of speakers. Uh, and uh, they'll be co-presenting throughout. So with that in mind, you should put your, uh, if you don't want the pictures of the vault reconstructions uh, to be impaired, uh, you should put your view on a PC in the top right-hand corner into, uh, for a technical reason, onto speak that I don't quite understand, onto speaker view, okay? That's what we're looking for, speaker view. Right, to the introductions. Uh, I'll begin with uh, Dr. Alex Buchanan. She, Alex is senior lecturer in archive studies at the University of Liverpool. And she's been there for, I can't quite remember now, it'll be about 14, 15 years, I think. An architectural historian, as well as an archivist. Uh, she has a vast knowledge of the early historiography of English medieval architecture. You know, to know her monograph on the Victorian architectural historian, Robert Willis, published by Boydell in 2013 is to admire it greatly. And we hope she'll do more work in this vein in the future. Uh, Dr. Nick Webb is a lecturer at the Liverpool School of Architecture and a qualified architect. His research involves the application of digital imaging in relation to historical architecture. And he's interested in the idea that digital technology can actually add to our knowledge of medieval buildings. Uh, we'll be hearing something about that in tonight's lecture as well. And Dr. James Hilson, uh, also well known to many of us, postdoctoral researcher on the Tracing the Past project. James is a historian of English and French Gothic architecture, did a PhD at York on St. Stephen's Chapel. And after that, he had a, a postdoc at Cambridge, at Emmanuel in Cambridge for uh, three years. Uh, He's producing a book arising out of his PhD, and he's, he's particularly interested in the transmission of architectural forms, so influence, I guess. Uh, some of us will have seen that fluent, compelling article he wrote on Raynon and uh, Giardonico's sketchbook, so-called sketchbook, in uh, a recent number of Gesta. Okay, so there we have it. I'll now ask Alex, Nick, and James to give their presentation, which is titled Tracing the Past, three-dimensional analysis of medieval vaults. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. And good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming this evening. It seems peculiarly appropriate that we're talking about digital analysis of architecture at a time when this is all that has been possible for some months. And our paper this evening aims to introduce and showcase the project that Julian's just mentioned, which received a grant of nearly £250,000 from the Arts and Humanities Research Council in 2018. And it's, um, it's actually Nick who is the principal investigator on that project. The genesis of the project, however, extends back as long as my connection with the British Archaeological Association, when as an undergraduate, I wrote my dissertation on three dimensionality in English 14th century vaulting. I'd observed that in the side aisles of Wells Cathedral, the 12 bays of the vaults had four different shapes, despite ostensibly having the same plan. You can see in the slide that in the north aisle there are level ridges, whereas in the south aisle the vault has a more bulbous, even domical shape. I was determined to try and find out why, but with existing analogue tools it was impossible to progress beyond these visual observations which at Wells have the additional impediment of the thick plaster on the vault cells, both below and above, making the stonework impossible to access. And until my path crossed with Nick Webbs in 2014, I didn't have the computer skills to be able to investigate further. 
Our collaboration led to the project we're going to talk about, which has involved us scanning the vaults at the 12 sites shown in the slide. We've also been lucky enough to have been given scans of Pershaw Abbey. This evening, we're going to be talking about the digital methods we've been using and about some of our findings, showing the potential of these methods for expanding the study of architecture and offering new insights into medieval design and construction. We'll conclude by advertising what we're going to be up to over the next few months in the hope that you'll be able to join us again to find out some of the more detailed findings relating to individual sites. So I'll now hand over to Nick, who's been, as I said, the principal investigator on this project and has taken the lead on the digital side. Thanks, Nick. Good evening, everyone. Uh, so just to talk through our digital methodology that we use, uh, we looked at three different methods of surveying medieval vaults. Those were total station, laser scanning and photogrammetry. So the first one, total station, works by looking through a viewfinder. Guided by a laser, you find a position in three dimensional space, press the side of the scanner and it records the distance between it and that solid surface. So you can build up something like you see in the top central image here, which is a dot to dot kind of plan of uh, one of the vaults in the chapter house at Chester. So what are the advantages of total station? Well, the data is precise and it's selected. So you're only recording what is required. In the example I've just shown you, that's the Entradas line of individual vault ribs. But this is also a disadvantage because it could, could be, for example, that you want to learn more about the webbing in between the ribs. So you'd have to go and record that separately. Another disadvantage of total station is that surveying times can be quite long. It takes us typically an hour to two hours to survey an individual bay. And the scans that are produced, they're not in color uh, and you don't get a full 3D model. So we abandoned Total Station quite early on in the project. However, that's not to say that it isn't useful. We've seen this particularly in the work of some of our colleagues in Spain. For example, you could very accurately record a rib profile. Uh, it'd take a bit of time, but it is something that we might revisit at a later date. So the next method that we investigated was laser scanning. And much like the total station, it records the distance between it and every solid surface that it hits. But rather than doing this individually per point, it does it hundreds and thousands of times over automatically. And what you end up with is almost like a swarm of bees, but in the shape of a building interior. The good thing about Laser scanning as well is it produces beautiful color outputs. So as part of the scan cycle, it takes a series of color photographs and convert those into a color for each individual point. It's important to note that if there are obstacles in the scanner's line of sight, you need to take more than one scan. You can see that in the diagrams on the left-hand side. So the lower of the left-hand diagram, we've placed a chandelier just as a demonstration. So if that's the case, it will miss parts of the vaults above. So you have to move the scanner around those obstacles. So advantages of laser scanning, again, the data is very precise. It records every single detail. So we're focusing obviously on the medieval vaults above, but at the same time, the scanner is picking up the elevations of the interiors and the floors of the interiors. It's relatively fast as well. Each scan that we take is typically either about 10 minutes or 30 minutes. We use a 10 minute scan for lower vaults and we use about a 30 minute scan for some of the high vaults that we're looking at. Disadvantages though, very large files, so you need a pretty powerful computer to be able to do anything with the data. Likewise, it's very expensive. The scan is about £50,000 uh, along with uh, the software that you require. We can export from the data though, a, a series of ortho photos. So this is orthographically uh, corrected perspective images. Um, also, we can create mesh models. So you see examples of an ortho photo in the top center and a mesh model uh, below that, which is basically a surface model created from the points. Uh, so it's triangulated surfaces. The final method that we investigated was photogrammetry. So 
here you can see JR on the right of the screen, one of our technicians taking photos for this. So just using a standard digital SLR camera, you'll notice he's being carefully observed by the Cathedral Cat at Wells. Uh, so take often hundreds of photos of the target that you're interested in, then you import those photos into a clever piece of software called Agisoft Metashape. It processes the images and it can look at the perspective and work out where the image is taken from, combine these together into a 3D model, which like laser scanning is a point cloud. And again, like laser scanning, you can export from this ortho photos and surface mesh models. So advantages of photogrammetry, it's inexpensive compared to laser scanning. So you just need a digital camera, even uh, the, the camera in your phone will do, uh, and a copy of Metashape, which is about 500 pounds. Advantages, uh, further advantages, high quality images come out of it. Um, disadvantage, the quality of the mesh is not so good. And we'll touch more on that in a second. So here you can see another example. This is the Lady Chapel at Exeter Cathedral, uh, and it's based on a laser scan. So the ortho photo in plan. So we were quite confident that the geometry we were getting here was accurate, but you can see that the image itself is quite grainy. If we compare that to the photogrammetry version, again, looks like the geometry is pretty good, but the quality of the image is far superior to that of the laser scan. And likewise, in section, we can see a similar result. So quite a grainy laser scan, uh, but pretty good in terms of the photogrammetry. So at this stage, you're probably thinking photogrammetry is the one to move forwards with. But looking at some detailed investigations, it starts to unravel slightly. But before we come to that, let's just compare what happens when we look at the point cloud data uh, and we take a column cut from a relatively low level, about a meter above ground. The left-hand side image, we can see the result of that cut taken from a laser scan. And on the right, we can see the result taken from photogrammetry. And in both cases, the result is good. And that is because with the laser scanner and a camera used for photogrammetry, we can get pretty close to this as a target because again, it's low level, about a meter or so. However, when we look at the vaults high above us, about 10 meters, um, that's where photogrammetry starts to unravel as a method. So the left of the screen here, we can see a laser scan version of a rib cut, so a rib profile, and we're getting a pretty good result from that. But if you look at the next image along from the left, the photogrammetry result, it's a lot poorer. So again, the main reason is with photogrammetry, it helps to be close to the target that you're trying to capture. Whereas with laser scanning, even if you're relatively far away, about 10 meters, you tend to get quite good results. So because of this, we chose laser scanning as our primary method uh, for surveying the vaults. And here's a quick video. This is uh, at Lincoln, although it's doing something weird. Let's try again. There we go, should be working now. Yeah, this is uh, the laser scanner at Lincoln. And you can see, really simple process. It sits on the top of a tripod. It's not a problem being in the cathedral. It doesn't disrupt anybody. You just have to make sure that no one trips over the tripod basically. And you repeat that process. So once we have the laser scans, uh, we take a series of laser scans. We must point that out. Uh, the reason being, as we touched on earlier, it's based on line of sight. So if the scanner can't see a detail, then it won't be captured in the point cloud. So we tend to take one laser scan per volt bay. And because of the overlap between bays, we get a good coverage. And we can see an example of that here using different colors for point clouds in the North Choir Isle at Wells Cathedral. So we start with these individual point clouds and we have to register them to each other. So we have to make sure that they're aligned properly. And there's two ways we do it. In the early days, we would use targets. So we put up pieces of paper with a cross on or use a sphere um, and the software can automatically recognize these and then it aligns the scans with each other. But more recently, the software has improved and it can look at individual point clouds, recognize geometry inside these buildings and then automatically align the scans with each other. So as we've touched on before, um, 
the outputs that we get from the point cloud. The first one that we see on the right hand side, this is another example of an ortho photo, this time in planning section from the Lady Chapel at Ely. So that's probably the first thing we do in most cases. And then the second output that we take is the mesh models themselves. So these triangulated surface models. And you can see an example of that here. So what do we do when we've got this data? We're really interested in the intradus line of each individual volt rib. This is really important because when the volts were being built, you would have put the centering up. You can see an image example of that here on the right. And then obviously in stonework, you would build the ribs over the top of that. So this position where the timber and stone would have sat against each other is the intradus line. So for us, this gives us a really key insight into the geometry of how these vaults were designed and constructed. So here's just an image on the right. Uh, you can see where we've started to trace along the Entradas line using 3D software called Rhinoceros. And from this, again, we can export 2D views if they're helpful. So we can do that in section and plan. But crucially, what we have here is a traced version of each individual rib. And then from that, we can start to look at some of the key geometry. So the first thing we have is the impost line. So this is the point in which the springing point of a rib appears to rest. And it's usually at abacus level, so the top of a column capital. Next, we have the springing point, which we've already alluded to. You can see that on the cross on the right hand side of the image. So this is the point in which each fault rib starts. And that's almost always a fixed point. Next, we have the apex point. And this is notional in our case because with many medieval vaults, the vast majority of them, they're covered by a boss stone. But using the 3D modeling software, we can extend these out and work out where the notional apex is, so where the arcs would have met each other in space. Next, we have the radius, pretty self-explanatory. And finally, we look for the center point of the arc and its relationship to the impost line. So we tend to record whether it sits on that impost line, if it's above or if it's below. So I'll just conclude with a video if it works, yep, yeah, it's working, uh, showing how we trace some of the ribs. Uh, we sometimes do it manually. This is showing how we, we trace each rib manually. Other times we create automatic section cuts. So essentially it's, it's joining vertex points in this case. So along that intradus line of the vault rib, and a bit of a Blue Peter moment, here's several we did earlier. So you should now be able to see. So these are all the traced lines, but they're essentially snaking along. It's not true geometry. So the next thing that we need to do is highlight all of the points that make up that traced curve. And then we can run through that a best fit circle. So we're just highlighting the lines now. And here we can see, so a best fit circle has been created. We see it on the bottom right uh, screen that's shown. Then we trim it down. Uh, you can see the line highlighted in yellow, that's the impost level. So trim it down, neaten it up, do the same at the apex. And then this, this, this arc is ready for analysis. So first we can ask the software, what is the radius? So we've just highlighted that rib and as a command, we ask, ask the radius, as I said, uh, it churns that out in meters. We then copy and paste that into a data table. So, so for all of our sites, we have these quite complex data tables, which record, those key pieces of geometry. So the radius, and then next we go back in and we find the arc center point in relation to the impost line. In this case at Ely, uh, it's nearly a meter below. That's quite odd for most of our sites. Uh, 
and we do the same as well for the apex height. So I will just move that along now and I'll hand back to Alex so she can tell you a little bit more about our analysis. Okay, thanks, Nick. So once we've created and processed the scans, we can start to undertake the analysis and we can start to see patterns in the data, as we'll demonstrate in relation to Wells Cathedral. Although our research isn't primarily about the geometry of ground plans and elevations, it's worth pointing out that at some sites, like at Wells, we think that the original 12th century plan, including the transept and the two westernmost bays of the side aisles, was laid out on a modular system, which continued to be used in the 14th century eastern extension, as you can see on the slide. The same modules are found in different combinations in the 12th century transept and further east, perhaps not surprisingly, as the 14th century builders retained the first two bays of the eastern arm. The presence of modules is significant because what we found on most of our sites is that the vaults seem to have been laid out using a proportional system rather than measurements. In practical terms, we can easily see why this might have been the case, because in many buildings there were significant variations in bay sizes, meaning that any measured system would soon break down, whereas dividing a bay proportionally allows the same design to be used regardless of dimensions. The design tool we think architects may have used to divide a bay into proportions is what's been termed the star cut. This can be created easily using dividers and can be used to divide a bay into any fractions up to one hundredths. So the star cut could be used to divide a bay into thirds, as in the crazy vault at Lincoln, sixths, as in the southwestern bays of the choir aisles at Wells, and ninths, as in the high vaults of the choir and nave at Exeter. We also find fifths, again in the crazy vault at Lincoln, sevenths, as in the Eastern Transept Chapels at Wells, and thirteenths, as in the Lady Chapel at Ely, although we think in this case the thirteenths are a coincidental product of joining other points derived from the star cut, rather than a deliberate intention from the outset. Although the star cut isn't the only device for creating such proportions, we think it's the most likely, both because other tools which have been proposed are less practicable, and because we've also found variants of the star cut in use, both at Wells and at other sites. Whilst these don't have the advantages of creating fractional divisions of the bay, if this wasn't a requirement, they're just as useful for transferring a design concept across different sized bays, and are just as easy, if not easier, to produce using dividers. The apparent use of systems fundamentally similar to the star cut seems to make its use more likely than another different way of connecting proportional divisions. Once we've identified and tested our hypothesis for the two-dimensional plan of a vault, we then try to identify the processes used to establish its three-dimensional form. In post-medieval vaults, the three-dimensional form of a vault is generally determined in advance and the ribs are projected onto it using stereometric methods. By contrast, in medieval vaults, the three-dimensional form is a consequence of the curvature selected for the ribs. This had been the hypothesis formed by Robert Willis way back in 1841, which our research has been able to test. Since Willis's date, it has been suggested that medieval vaulting followed a trajectory towards standardization of rib curvatures, with the normative rib being a semicircular diagonal. This, however, has not been our finding. Instead, we found that most vaults in England have, vault, have ribs with a range of curvatures, which we believe were selected using a range of basic geometrical processes. Excluding ribs with more than one arc, these processes can be classified as following a chord method or a fixed radius method. So in order to investigate the rib curvatures, we create the sort of tables of dimensions that Nick has already shown, drawn from the wire flame frame models. And as a reminder, the key measurements, the height of the springing point, the height of the apex of the vault, the radius of each rib, and the distance of the center of the arc from the impost level. In general, our findings suggest that medieval architects considered that an arch should ideally have its center on the level of the impost line. And therefore, if any rib has this property, we feel it may be generative. Architects seem to have proceeded from fixed points upon which the choice of method for selecting rib curvatures depended. The vaults in the lower levels of the east end at Wells all have arcs with a single centre. 
If we look firstly at the height of the centres of these arcs in relation to the impost level, we can see that there are some patterns. In the 12th century quadripartite vaults of the pre-existing transept, the diagonal ribs have their centres at impost level, as do all the ribs in the western three bays of the south aisle, and most of the ribs in the equivalent bays of the north aisle, all shown in turquoise on the slide. Elsewhere, the wall arches have this feature, but it's otherwise more sporadic. Let's next look at the heights of the apexes of ribs, where we can see a somewhat similar pattern. The apex of the diagonal ribs of the transepts, shown as purple dots, seem to have informed the heights of the wall arches and the central bosses of the western bays of both side aisles, and some heights in the bays further east, but on the south side only. As the three western bays of the South Isles on both sides retained the arcades of the 12th century church, it's perhaps not surprising that their vaults were in part shaped by pre-existing dimensions. When we start to look at the radii of the arcs of the ribs, a rather different pattern emerges. Here we see that the majority of the radii in the eastern bays are within a similar range, shown in green, to those of the 12th century transept vaults, whereas those further west are not. This observation inevitably leads to the question of how the radii were established. What came first? The answer, not surprisingly, is it depends. When deciding how to turn a th two dimensional plan into a three dimensional vault, we believe that a medieval designer identified what points he wanted to regard as fixed. Although informed by the pre-existing architecture, this was a choice made by the designer probably with an understanding of the effect these choices would have on the architectural outcome. In most cases, the springing point was a given, and the impost level was determined by the springing point, although it could be disregarded. The apex could be fixed by reference to pre-existing heights, but usually offered a range of possibilities, provided that wall arches rose higher than any pre-existing window heads, and nothing rose higher than could be accommodated by any pre-existing or intended roof. It was also possible to regard the radius as fixed, enabling the reuse of any bevels or templates used to determine the curvature of a rib. In the Retro Choir and Eastern Bays of the South Isle, it appears that the designer regarded the radius, shown in, as green in the plan on the top left as fixed elements, perhaps taking it from the pre-existing vault ribs. In most of the retro choir and the eastern bays of the north choir aisles, the apex heights were also standardised, shown as red dots in the lower plan, and this produced level ridges, which in the retro choir were covered with ridge ribs. If the, retro, if the radius and the apex height of a rib are fixed, the only variable is the location of the centre, which could be found using what we've termed the three circles method. Firstly, a circle with the known radius is drawn with its centre on the springing point, the blue cross in the left-hand diagram. Next, a second circle of the same radius is drawn with its centre on the apex, shown as a green cross. Finally, a third circle with the same radius is drawn with both previous centres on its circumference, enabling the centre of the arc, shown as a red cross, to be identified. If the radius is not fixed, another method for identifying the location of an unknown centre is what we've called the two-chord two method. This is based on the principle that the radius and centre of a circle can be found when three points on that circle's circumference are known. We've not found this method used quite in this way at Wells, although the principle may have informed the method used in the high vault of the choir. In the western bays of the south choir aisle, the ribs all have their centres on the impost level, as shown in the top left plan. As shown in the second plan down, the radii are all the same, but these radii don't appear to have been copied from elsewhere in the building, so they probably weren't a fixed point. More likely to have been fixed are the apex heights of the wall ribs, shown in the third plan down, which seem to have derived from the height of the central boss of the transept chapel vaults, or the apex of the transverse ribs, which is the same as the height of most of the wall ribs in the transept chapels. For such ribs, where the level of the centre and the apex are known, the radius can be found by means of what we've called the chord method in which a line is drawn between the springing point and a known apex. If a second line is drawn as a perpendicular bisector of the first line, the point at which it intersects with the impost line is the centre, 
and the radius is the distance between this and the springing point, or this and the apex. Standardising the curvatures throughout a vault had advantages in terms of stone cutting, allowing any voussoir to be used for any rib. In these bays, the tiercerons have their centre on the impost and use the same radius as the bounding ribs. The unknown point here is the apex height, which could be discovered with what we call, we've called the two circles method. Here the starting point is the plan of the vault. A circle with the known radius is drawn sorry, is drawn with its centre at the springing point. The intersection between the circumference of this circle and the impost line becomes the centre for a second circle with the same radius, which represents the curvature of the rib. Its apex is found by drawing a perpendicular upwards from the end of the rib on plan until it intersects with the second circle. Fixing the radius rather than the height here results in a vault whose centre is higher than the transverse arches the Bombay form I'd initially identified as being different from the level ridges of the northeastern bays. Once we've hypothesized the process for deriving the three-dimensional form of the vault, we then compare the hypothetical model with the traced model to check their congruence. And as you can see here, they're pretty close. We're quite pleased with this one. And I'll now hand over to James, who'll look in more detail at what our methods can tell us about construction. Okay, excellent, thank you very much. Building a vault is not an easy task, and studying its construction process may perhaps be harder still. Though there is some variation from site to site, the structure of a rib vault is generally fairly similar, or so we assume. Spanning the gap between the two outer walls, the basic framework of the vault is provided by the network of ribs, usually consisting of finely carved molded stones. Atop this framework is a layer of stone called the webbing, filling the gaps between the ribs. This leaves a set of pockets between the wet vaulting and the outer wall, which are invariably filled with some sort of packing, usually a mixture of rubble and mortar. This is normally topped by several layers of concrete, often dating over multiple centuries. Some idea of what this looks like in practice can be gained by looking at the ruined vaults of Melrose Abbey in southern Scotland, where you can clearly see the distinction between the finely carved rib masonry the flat tile-like stones of the webbing, and the rubble infill behind. Yet whilst the dilapidated vaults at Melrose allow us to see the whole structure of the masonry, this is not possible in cases where the vault is still standing. The majority of the stonework is rendered invisible by the layers of concrete above and the ribs and webbing below, and even the, rib, the webs are usually concealed by a layer of plaster or whitewash. In order to investigate the construction processes for the vaults at our case study sites, we have therefore had to resort to other, more creative means of testing our hypotheses, in particular through the speculative, even experimental use of 3D modelling. In general, the construction of a medieval vault proceeded in a series of iterative steps. For the sake of simplicity, we have divided these, these into two distinct categories, stone cutting and stone laying. This is somewhat justified by the clear separation between these two tasks within medieval financial accounts, fabric accounts specifically, as stone cutting was generally the province of the masons, whereas stone laying was largely carried out by labourers or dedicated stone layers, though how specialised the latter really were is a matter for conjecture. Whereas the cutting of square stone blocks for walls and other purposes was a relatively straightforward process, vaults presented a number of more complex problems for masons, especially with the ribs. Each rib was conceived as the projection of a two-dimensional molding profile along a two-dimensional curve, with the resulting three-dimensional arc being subsequently divided up into three types of stones, tadachage blocks at the base, voussoirs in the middle, and bosses at the apex. By building digital models of the cutting processes for these different stones within a specific vault, we have been able to test a variety of different methods and see whether or not they allow us to reproduce our scanned data. This can be demonstrated using our principal case study for this process, which is the western bays of the South Choir Isle at Wells Cathedral. Cutting voussoirs was a relatively straightforward process for a medieval mason. The curvature and the angles of the joints were set up using a bevel, 
a sort of mason square with a curved edge representing the appropriate radius for the rib, which you can see here in stage two. The stone would then be cut to fit and a wooden template used to impose a molding profile on the top and bottom faces. With this in place, the masons could then proceed to the roughing out and fine carving stages, bringing the stone to completion. The bases of the ribs, however, presented a more complex problem as they marked the intersection of multiple rib profiles within a single location. For some early bolts, such as those in the West Range at Norton Priory, shown here, this was handled through a system of abutting stones, an insight for which we have to thank Stuart Harrison in particular. Yet as rib profiles became more complex and their number within a single vault started to multiply, masons instead began to combine their curvatures within a single block bonded directly into the wall behind. These tadashage blocks represented highly complex geometrical problems in their own right, requiring careful coordination of both the vault plan and the curvatures of the individual ribs to make them work. This is exemplified by a drawing which the architectural historian Robert Willis made of the upper face of a Tadashaj stone from Southwark Cathedral, then in the process of reconstruction. It shows the markings of several molding profiles on the surface of the stone, as well as the angles of the ribs. But the most important part is this critical point shown here, which represents the corner of the bay. It was around this point that the entire setting out process for a Tadashaj stone appears to have evolved, something which we have attempted to demonstrate through our 3D models. In the southwest Choir Isle at Wells, the Tadashaj is divided into two levels, a lower block with a horizontal cut on its upper face and an upper block with radial cuts connecting to the voussoirs above. Starting with the bottom face of the lower block, the corner point, which is alpha on this diagram, would be used to set out the angles of the ribs and the positions of the profiles in accordance with the bay plan. And looking through here, um, you can see moving from stage one, they define the corner, stage two, they define the edges of the profiles, and then in stage three, they impose the profiles on the surface. Now, the plan of the vault would normally be set out on a a one-to-one -one scale, usually with lines incised into some kind of floor surface. This is exemplified by the tracing floor at Wells, which still features the plan of a vault for the nearby 15th century cloister. This plan depicts the angles, curvature, and specific springing points for each individual rib, providing all of the information necessary for a tadashage to be set out. Something similar would also take place on the top face of the block. Vertical lines would be used to align the geometry of the ribs correctly with that on the bottom, and the two-dimensional geometry of the rib curvature will be used to locate the positions of the profiles on the horizontal cut, and you can see this here, it happened in stage five, which represents a flat two-dimensional drawing of the rib curvature that is used to define a series of heights and points, which are then imposed onto the um, block in stage six, allowing the profiles to be located. Good. So the curvature of each rib would then be added using a bevel, following a process similar to that of the voussoirs until the stone was completed. For the upper stones of the tadashage, the first stage would be to transfer the geometry of the, of the top face of the lower stone onto the bottom face of the upper stone. Vertical lines would again be used to align the top and bottom faces, with the geometry of the ribs being used to define a circle, delimiting the boundaries of the top face, allowing the curvature of each rib to be cut in. A bevel would then be used to define the upper joints of each rib in turn, providing the faces necessary for setting out the rib profiles, as you can see here, happening stage by stage. Um, defining geometry at the back to allow you to locate a bevel, using the bevel to define angles, and then on those angles placing your rib profiles, getting you up to stage 10. And finally, with this all completed, the stone would be cut to shape, using the same roughing out and fine carving process that we discussed previously for both the lower, for both the lower stone and for the voussoirs. By far the most complex element of stone cutting was the bosses, and not just for their often impressive sculptural effects. Um, I apologize for the pun, by the way. Each boss was the result of the convergence of multiple ribs from several different angles, requiring great care to be taken to ensure that the geometry and profile of each rib matched. 
The top and bottom faces of a boss would be relatively straightforward to set out, requiring only the information provided by the vault plan. However, defining the angles and the curvatures of the rib studs was a more stubs rather was a more um, involved process, necessitating careful use of the bevel on the rib curvatures set out using a one-to-one -one scale drawing. And looking here, you can see it's it's rather complex. So I'm not going to go through it in exhaustive detail, but you can see that a two-dimensional drawing is used to work out again relative heights, um, positions of cuts, this sort of thing, which can then be transferred using a bevel. As I just indicated, the resulting geometry could then be transferred onto the surfaces of the blocks, allowing the joints and the molding profiles of the intersecting ribs to be set out. And together with a bevel being used to give you the rib curvature, this would provide the masons with all the information necessary for the rough and fine carving of the uh, boss. And you can see there, there's a blank area where the uh, sculpture is eventually going to go. This appears to have been standard practice, and sometimes bosses would be being produced by a dedicated professional, though whether that was purely for the sculpture or for the boss as a whole, it is not entirely clear. I suspect it varied on a site-by-site -site basis. Once the stones had been cut to shape, it was time to start laying them out. The Tadashar stones would probably already have been set in place at the same time as the outer walls, though there is evidence in some sites that they were inserted later. The rest of the ribs would be assembled with the aid of scaffolding and formwork, providing a wooden frame on which the stones of the ribs could rest. According to our consultant masons, the boss would be the first stone to be set in place. Whilst this might seem counterintuitive, it would have provided the stone layers with a point to work towards, making it easier to align the stones correctly and cut them down as required. So looking here, um, formwork installed, um, boss stone is added at the top. They start adding the voussoirs on top of the data charge and they build it up to until there is a complete um, framework of ribs. The exact nature of the formwork is likely to have varied a lot from site to site. But an example can still be found in the bell tower at Leerbraukirke on the island of Gotland, which we have sadly yet to visit. Fabric accounts suggest that similar designs were employed for some English vaults, consisting of a wooden floor connected to the rib arcs by upright timbers of the sorts seen here. The next phase in the construction process would be the laying of the webbing. Whilst the joints between the ribs at wells are readily visible, the stonework is concealed behind a layer of plaster, making it impossible to study. However, there are some of our sites where the mason is still exposed, among them the cathedral church at Exeter, as you can see right here. Studying the structure of the webbing presented two major methodological problems for our research. The first was to find a means of quantifying the geometry of the masonry surface, preferably in a visual medium. I just, I did not have the stomach for trying to do it mathematically. The second was to account for how that geometry was produced in terms of individual stone courses. In order to accomplish this, we test the range of different methods to see what was useful, all using 3D modeling software, specifically rhinoceros. The first method which we used was a system of contours, analogous to the contours denoting different heights on an ordnance survey map. Whilst these do give a general idea of the gradient and the shape of the slopes within the webs, they unfortunately do nothing to show the disposition of the masonry courses, a problem if you're trying to analyze how a vault's webs were constructed. Attempts to make the contours more granular using a color-based height map yielded the same results, as it didn't actually change that much, given that it only records the height of each vertex or point on the surface of the mesh model, not its orientation within three-dimensional space. A more successful method was course tracing. This involves tracing the center lines of each course of masonry individually, using a method similar to that which Nick has outlined for tracing rib in Prados lines. And the reason why we went with the center rather than with the masonry lines is because masonry lines are actually harder to identify on a mesh model. Sorry, not masonry, I mean the mortar lines to be to clarify. Yet, whilst this does allow the position and orientation of courses to be identified in a general sense, it is an imprecise technique and it is not easy to gain a clear understanding of how the courses were laid out on a stone by stone basis. What we eventually settled on is a method which we have called normal vector mapping. What is that? 
Well, I'm afraid that to explain, I need to dip my toes into the mathematics a little bit. So if I lose any of you, I'm sorry. As Nick indicated earlier, the surface of a mesh model consists of a dense network of uh, uh, shapes, really, a series of tessellating triangles, each formed by three um, vertices. In order for the software to be able to render the surface texture of the model properly, this is the texture produced by the series of photographs taken in laser scanning, each of these faces possesses a normal vector, which is a means of representing the orientation of each facet using a three-dimensional coordinate system, i.e. a direction defined using an x, y, and z component. Each component possesses a value extending from 1 to negative 1, with the x component relating its orientation from east to west, the y component from north to south, and the z component from top to bottom. What normal vector mapping does is take just one of these vector components and convert it into a color gradient, in this case from black to white. As the stones are generally flat faced, this means that the orientation of each individual block can be picked out directly, making it easy to identify how the shape of the webs was built up stone by stone. The results of the Z component map are effectively the same as measuring the gradient. This makes it easy to identify the general shapes of the coursing, as well as to get a real sense for how the curvature is changing over the surface of the webs as they rise from bottom to top. By looking in the, at the X and Y components, however, we can get a more precise sense of what is going on in the individual courses. In the X component map shown here on the right, the longitudinal tunnel is mostly solid white, indicating that it is a fairly continuous tunnel where the stones do not rotate much towards the east or west. The only exception is at the base of the webs, where a darker color indicates that the stones start to turn outwards a little bit. In the transverse tunnel, by contrast, we would expect a transition from black to white, which is exactly what we get, with the dark color suggesting a very steep gradient for the webs. However, the webs adjoining the north and south windows are noticeably different, with a far lighter gradient than their fellows. The reasons for this can be seen in the Y component map. Whilst we would expect the transverse tunnel to be largely white in this case, the outer webs are significantly darker than the inner ones, especially those adjoining the windows. This suggests that the lower courses of masonry in, the, masonry in these webs are turned towards the north or south, the angle of the courses changing with each successive layer. The results of this can be seen directly on the model, where the webbing has a slightly twisted appearance, a phenomenon that is known as plowsharing. The reason for this is the difference in curvature between the two ribs which are defining the boundaries of the web, as can be seen here. And this is, let's see, how, how best to interpret this. If we start on the top um, left of the left diagram, um, that is a depiction of the curvatures of the wall rib, which is rib DG, and you can see that ties up with the uh, plan immediately to the, the quarter plan rather, immediately to the right of that, and DR, which is the next tier so on in from that particular one, and you can see there that the curvatures of those two are extremely different, DG being governed much more strongly by the clerestory window. Given how disparate they are, there's, you, can, you can see why the courses would have to twist in order to move from one to the next. And you can see that in the course tracing in the plan on the right. The same process is also happening in other examples. Um, you can see that in web P there to a lesser extent, but by web Q and web R, they're starting to um, even out a little bit more. And in webs S and T, they are much more, um, they're much more what you would um, expect um, intuitively in this case. So normal vector mapping allows us to show how this was achieved on a stone by stones basis, building up course by course until the whole web was completed. And as a coder, I'd like to say that this technique is particularly useful for studying some of the more complex examples of webbing we have found. And I will, I will just leave you on this particular slide of the name Nave Isles at Tewkesbury Abbey, where the normal vector map reveals the changing curvatures of the individual courses which form the cambered surface of the outer webs. Um, they don't quite bulge outwards, but they do have a they do have quite a complex three-dimensional curvature that's been revealed by this almost sort of um, 
it's almost fabric like really series of different types of layered courses at different angles. Um, uh, more on that in another paper. So with my bit done, I'm going to turn over to Alex for some concluding remarks. Thanks. James. So we hope this brief overview has given you a taste of the sort of questions we've been asking and the sort of findings we've made over the course of our projects. Although we've undertaken some analysis of all our sites, we're still very much at the beginning and probably have years of work ahead of us examining them in greater detail. Our findings to date will be shared in a book due for publication by Routledge this summer and online on our website, including via an online exhibition, which we're currently in the process of curating. We've also planned a series of lectures and workshops on some of our key sites, and we'll be delighted to see you again on Zoom at one of these. Check out Eventbrite for further details. And if you'd like to be kept up to date with the project, please subscribe to our newsletter, which you can do via our website or by scanning the QR code. Thanks very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, all three, uh, Alex, Nick, and James. And I'm so sorry to have uh, demoted you, Nick. I didn't mean to do that. It's a bit of job conditioning on my part because I, I knew Alex and knew of her involvement with this. I, I, I made that silly mistake. So uh, that mistake corrected. Uh, and we're going to have questions now. And you've been asked already, please, uh, if you don't mind to put your questions and comments into the uh, into the Q and A box, not into the chat box, okay? And I'll be looking there for questions and comments as we go along. Uh, this is a very generous uh, range of talks and sort of presentations and programs you have on your website. I wonder how well they've been attended so far. The sorts of things you're doing at Nantwich and Lincoln and things like this, you know. We haven't had any of the lectures and workshops yet, so we, we don't know how many people are going to turn up to them, but we, we hope we get the sort of attendance that, um, Jay, that Nick's had at um, things that he's done previously. So we'll, 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 we'll wait and see. Um, we had a symposium that some members of the association attended back in 2016, and that was very well attended. So um, hopefully we'll get we'll get some repeat custom from that. Um, and we know that when we're in cathedrals, we get a lot of interest from people wanting to know what we're doing. So um, hopefully again, we're sorry that we haven't been able to do things like the exhibitions in real space and time, which was what we had anticipated, what we'd hoped for in the drawing up of the project. But um, if we have it online, more people will be able to attend from wider afield. So we lose some things, we gain other things. Yes, of course, there is that. Everybody's finding that at the moment. But it seems a particular pity not to be able to give these things in situ when you're talking about such wonderful buildings. Uh, we've got a we've got a question from uh, we've got a question from Alfie Robinson. Uh, before I ask it, uh, somebody else asked, would it be possible to put the website URL into chat? Yeah, I thought I That's thought already done. It, to tell you the truth, yeah. So uh, Helen, it should already be there. Uh, and if you can't find it, then you can email, easily find one of the team members or indeed me on the, uh, on the internet. Yeah, and we can, we can send it on the email and we can send it to you. Yes, uh, so I'll... if I might add briefly to that, we are presently redesigning the website. So, um, so, so it's going to have a massive facelift with a lot of new resources online um, very shortly. Uh, we're just um, getting everything in place at the moment. So that's going to include the ability to go site by site through each one of our case studies and look at all of the models we've got. It's also going to link up to our um, archive on the archaeology data service, which is where we've been uploading all of our data, or at least most of this anyway, as much as we can get away with. So um, which should allow people to download any of our um, ortho photos or models for an, any non-commercial purpose. Is that is OK, that, is thank that you right? very much, James. That's, that's, that's great. Thanks. There we go. Um, Alfie's question is, do you think the vaults were trialled or dry fitted in a workshop or a mason's lodge before construction? Um, shall I start with that one? I think everybody's probably got some views on that. Um, I think it would be difficult to trial the whole thing in a mason's workshop. Um, but, and it's clear that they are changing things. I mean, as you can see from Wells, 
the different bays are done differently. So they are making changes as they as they build things. Um, and we've got no we've got no reference in, in any documentation to things being trialed. So um, I'm not I'm not sure what how we'd know whether they did, if that makes sense. I don't know what the evidence would be for that. Um, and I'm not sure again what what advantage it would be other than if they were trying something very very experimental and seeing whether that stood up but I don't know um mm -hmm. over to James and Nick if you've got any views well I, I I can say something I mean I I think it's somewhat unlikely I I don't really see how much advantage it would um give somebody for several reasons one of which being that the in order to in order to, to do a dry assembly of a vault you'd need to have your um formwork being made first on and whilst you could do that on the ground in advance you know it, it would also then need to be disassembled and reassembled up high so it's actually quite a complex process doing that the next issue is one of space and this is something which is a more general problem and it's something i've been considering particularly in relation to the tracing floor because one of our problems is we do think they're reliant on these one-to-one -one scale drawings on the one hand but on the other hand almost every surviving trace of floor is almost completely inaccessible i mean it's it's they tend to be high up in a you know, in a place you can only get to through going through some low um, structures. So there's actually quite a lot of questions to be raised about what the sort of workshop conditions were and how they were transferring these um, ideas from one location to another, um, how they were testing out the assembly of stones in advance. But I think that if someone was confident in the um, accuracy of their stone masonry, then they could be confident in the results of it. And okay. the only real difference you'd need would be cutting down the voussoirs a bit at the top if you made a mistake. Yeah, OK, thank you very much, James. We've got quite a number of questions coming in. So perhaps uh, perhaps the panel would would nominate a member to answer each one, as it were, rather than uh, three. I'm sorry, I, I hope that doesn't sound uh, presumptuous, but uh, it's just that we do have uh, questions here, and I'm worried we won't get through them all. Okay. Uh, Yes, <laughs> it's, it's always a sign of a it's always a sign of a stimulating talk. Of course, it, one gets a lot of questions. Huh? Um, well, we can answer Bob straight away. The three D models on Sketchfab are already up on Sketchfab, so um, okay. look at that. So that's good to know. Jenny Alexander asks, "Your very precise measuring is giving us so much information. Can you comment on the accuracy of cutting by the masons? What margin of error they were working to?" Nick. I think the answer probably is that it depends on the site. Um, Jenny probably knows already at Lincoln, we've found that the high vaults there, uh, particularly St. Hugh's Choir, are incredibly accurate. Uh, we normally work to about 100 millimetres. So if we think a radius, for example, is part of a, a set, um, if it's 100 millimetres out of a particular figure, then we think it could be uh, an intentional different design decision. but uh, Lincoln, very accurate. Um, places like Chester in the Lady Chapel and the Chapter House, though, they are snaking all over the place and uh, a lot harder to analyse. Um, yeah, I think that's all I'll say for now. OK, uh, and just to add to, uh, before we go to the next question, this is just a comment that doesn't require an answer. Jenny adds that the sections of King's College Chapel conoids have assembly marked, mar marks which suggest they were dry assembling by the 16th century. Uh, okay, so John Goodall says, thank you for a super talk. Does the creation of penetrated barrel vaults require particular distortions in the laying out geometries you have described? I can repeat that. Want to answer that. Sorry? Does anybody want to answer that one particularly? I, I, I can have a go. So does the creation of penetrated barrel vaults require a particular sort of for laying out the geometries you have described? I think that it depends what you mean by penetrated barrel vaults. Um, if you're referring to the sorts of rib vaults which we've been using today, which have two, uh, a longitude and a transverse tunnel interpenetrate, then, they, then um, the distortions are not really the issue. The is because what matters is the framework of ribs that you set out. And once you have that framework of ribs, you then have to, you, you, you then have your webbing that you insert on top of that. And usually that will correspond 
to the curvatures of those ribs, which are the defining aspects of the geometry. Sometimes it will not. And this, this, these are there are particular cases, such as the Isle of Tewkesbury, where the webbing is actually has a, has a degree of curvature which is independent from those of the ribs, bulging out slightly, this sort of thing. So it really does depend, but I think seeing it as distortions is perhaps not the best way of framing the discussion because that implies there's some kind of ideal sort of vault form which they're trying to achieve. And I don't think that's how the design or construction process operates. They don't see it as distortions, it just is the process of doing it. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, James. And John also says, and do you have a medieval illustration of a boss being placed first? That's obviously an interesting point. Um, I'm not aware of any medieval illustration of a of even vaults being placed, to be honest, not at least, but Alex may have it no more. No, I can't. Um, the, the idea that this should happen that way round, we've seen in the chat room, somebody's mentioning um, Peter Dare, um, who built vaults in Australia. And he said, so he's a mason who's done this. And he said, that's the way they would always do it. And once we started to think about that, it solved a lot of other problems. So that's why we think that the way that it was being done with modern vaults, probably works for the Middle Ages, but no, we haven't got any, as far as I'm aware, we haven't got any contemporary evidence of this. Okay, thanks very much, Alex. So David Fogden, Fogden asks, the arch shapes of windows enable historians to date the windows. Have you found similar clues among the shapes of vaulting? Um, not, not as clearly as tracery, no. Um, if you were dating vaulting from a form, I think you'd be more likely to use the moulding profiles. But we have found some patterns, shall we say, that, um, for example, the, um, the idea that a ridge rib should be horizontal is an idea that seems to develop. It, it's not there from the start. So we do see some sort of big patterns, but not something where you'd be able to say, oh, that vault clearly looks 1230 or something like that. Thank you. Robert Shepard says, fascinating. How much distortion do you find? This may be following on from an answer given before. How much distortion do you find in vaults? And can you distinguish post-construction distortion from inaccuracy in construction? I mean, this is one of the problems that we're, yeah. we're forever challenging ourselves with. And we want to go and look at one, one of the next buildings on our, our wish list is Beverly Minster, where we know there's a lot of distortion. And we think we could use that as quite an interesting test case for um, somewhere where we know there's distortion and model that against buildings where we're less less sure there's distortion. Um, at Wells, the southeast choir aisles, the three bays um, of the east end, are very much more distorted than some of the others. And some of that could be post-construction distortion because there are some iron tie beams that have been put in. So clearly at some point, somebody worried, but it's difficult to tell. Where you can see where you've got no plaster on the masonry and you can see cracks and gaps then you've clearly got distortion so so it's mm -hmm. it's an interesting challenge but we found so far less than we would expect we think um, one of the things we look we've looked for is whether any of the walls are out of vertical because if the vault is kind of going outwards like that the walls are going to start going like that and in British English thick wall construction, we're not finding that. So I think it would be more of a problem for our continental counterparts than it is for us. But okay. it's something we're always alert to. Generally, okay. if there's an oddity in the ground plan, which is visible from the from our top down auto ortho photos we produce, then there is something odd about the way the ribs have been set out or something like that. So you can usually tell from other um, factors. Okay, thank you, James. That's interesting. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Bob Marshall, we've already had uh, the information there. An anonymous attendee asks, uh, says the practicalities of web construction are very interesting. Were the webs built from scaffolding below the ribs or from above? So that's a question that's entering, etc. I am not sure. 
Um, I think you'd have to ask someone who was more of a specialist on scaffolding and um, and um, formwork, and it's almost sort of good luck finding them. Really, um, it's not something we know that much about. But I suspect you would have to you would have to stand above the um, vault. And what what we do have is the account account fabric accounts for Westminster Abbey do include a quite precise description of a vault as it's taken down. Um, and that gives you information that they have a floor above it, they have a floor below it, they also have winches on that particular one, and this is 15th century if I recall correctly, so they're, they've, got, they've got sort of very large scale sort of jinnies and other machines to help pull things up to that level. And there is this network of sort of things, between, they also have something to keep the wind off, there's a there's a there's a large sort of uh, canvas um, cover um, to keep the wind off it. So clearly that is an issue, especially if the um, uh, formwork is still open to the webbing. But given the weight of a stone, I think you'd probably have to place it down on something. Um, is my mm -hmm. feeling. And what we surmise of the way that the um, centering is formed with all the, the forest of poles, been, I think it would be very difficult to do anything from underneath. Um, I think it would have to be done from above. Thank you very much. Tom Nixon asks, have you been able to link particular techniques or preferences to architects or workshops of different sites? Or do you think the conditions of the sites determine choices more than anything else? I think if, if I could pick up on that one, I, I would say not yet. I think that's one of the next steps we need to take uh, to investigate that is all these different geometrical methods that we've identified, we now need to categorize and see if there are patterns that emerge across, well, first at individual sites and then comparisons to other sites. Although we do see some uh, some design choices being made, and the example of Wells, the the choir aisles there is probably the one that we keep coming back to all the time because it's so uh, it's just so easy to see. Uh, in the southwest, a definite design decision has been taken to do something different compared to the other three sets of aisles. So, yeah, more work to do, I think. Thank you very much, Nick. And I saw too late, great voice of mine, uh, that Tom Nixon uh, follows that up by saying, I should clarify that my question relates to construction and setting out techniques rather than vault patterns or rib profiles. Okay, so just to make that clarification. Well, uh, for, for construction setting out techniques, Yes, I, I'm not sure how much you could say. One thing that I think the, the critical difficulty with that is the only thing you can study in most cases is the ribs. Um, and in order to actually do a really detailed study of the stonemason, you would have to do in practice detailed photogrammetry of the ribs at high up, possibly using drone surveys. And that's an option which Nick has certainly been considering. Um, um, and sounds rather exciting. but. Um, it's actually very difficult to do that with the sort of data that we have. I can only do the normal vector analysis for web surfaces where the webs are actually visible. And if they are concealed by plaster, it is not possible to do so. So at present, we do not have a large enough sample size to make any decisive uh, interpretations of that, shall we just say. Um, and I'm not sure it's necessarily going to be possible to do that within English medieval vaults, because so many of them are so wonderfully plastered to protect them. Okay, thank you very much, James. Uh, Brian Ferrimond asks, are all the rib curves you have investigated arcs of circles? The, the vast majority, yes. Uh, I mean, it's still arcs of circles, but we do get multiple centered arcs. Um, the only exception I can think of, if you exclude ridge ribs, which tend to be straight, um, are sometimes around window tracery. Um, you sometimes get a different pattern emerging, um, but the, the main answer really is no. That would be my conclusion. Don't know about you guys. Well, the, the only thing I will say is that when it gets to Leon's, it's, it is not, we, we've had some difficulties because there, for, so for example, the rib, uh, the ridge rib, well, it's not Leon's, but the ridge rib at St. Hugh's Choir is a series of little sort of, uh, curves going down the length of it. And some early ridge ribs are like that, some late ones too, but tends to be earlier. 
Um, and a lot of the urns are just little sort of edged curves. And because of the way that our recording of geometry works, um, we can't really get measurable data from those because the curve there is not long enough for us to get a reliable result for the radius, which makes it very difficult to assess how those particular ones worked out. And given how variable they seem to be, it does look like they just cut a curve. Um, and they relied on, you know, a mason just eye, eyeing it and saying, well, I know, I know what this needs to be. It's possible they had a template for those two, but it's not clear how those particular ones were realized. So in some cases, it's possible a more ad hoc approach was used, but it would only be for very small lengths of rib. Thank you very much, James. Someone has birds tweeting away in the background. That's very nice. Um, okay, so there's just a couple more comments now that I see that we haven't Jenny, Jenny Alexander again said, thanks, Nick. That comment on the Lincoln Crazy Vault is really valuable. I can't remember quite what that refers to. But she also says, which people may find interesting, that Guedelong in France have found that to be true as well at their castle vaults. So uh, I don't know if that requires any comment. Uh, and that is, all, that is all we have at the moment. And there are no more questions coming in. So given that, uh, it only remains for me to remind people uh, who are still here, uh, and that's 65 of us by the look of it, that uh, yes, the symposium, the team symposium will be held on Thursday, the 19th of August. It's an online symposium. So you can hear a lot more about the project there. And there are some really illustrious people uh, speaking at that symposium too. So it'll be a great event, uh, Thursday, 19th of August. Um, Remember, too, if you will, that our next talk is on Wednesday, the 5th of May, and it's Rachel Delman, Dr. Rachel Delman, University of York, on her title is Women and the Built Environment in Late Medieval Scotland. So it's a, it's a patronage and cultural history topic. Okay, so uh, with that, I just, just remains really to thank Nick, Alex and James for giving us their time and giving us such a lot to think about with reference to these uh, wonderful buildings. And uh, yeah, to wish everybody a safe and uh, cheerful time until we meet again. Okay, thank you very much, everyone. <laughs>